So uh, it's, a, it, it's a great pleasure to have uh, a colleague, someone who collaborated with um, the Allen Institute and, and iLabs collaborated on a, uh, a brain salon, it was almost two years ago now, um, uh, with Pat Cool. She says she's channeling uh, Marlena Dietrich today. Uh, so um, anyway, we, we, it's, very, it's always nice to, to hear from Pat, so welcome. Channeling has to do with this cold, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today and to congratulate Paul on the 10th anniversary of the Allen Brain Institute. Uh, I remember the night when Paul's uh, brain atlas for the mouse was on NBC News, and we were also on at iLabs because of our MEG brain imaging on babies. So it was Seattle Brain Night, and we were here at the party. Uh, I want to thank Paul in particular for all he's done for uh, all of us, both in the arts and in the sciences, and, um, and especially on the brain, the Obama Brain Initiative. Uh, but also for sports fans, he's brought the Seahawks and Russell Wilson here. Go Hawks! So um, we're going to talk today about a classic puzzle in developmental psychology and brain science, and that is the puzzle of language. We know that for millennia, philosophers and psychologists, engineers and neuroscientists have debated what's the nature of language and what is built in and how does the baby learn. Uh, they're very, very interesting questions that we can ask way beyond the Chomsky-Skinner debates that are now almost 60 years old. Uh, what are the learning algorithms that babies put to work? And are they speech and language specific or are they general? What about brain tissue? Are there exclusive areas for speech? Or again, are those uh, areas that are both speech and other complex auditory signals? When, when genes uh, open up critical periods, what determines that opening and closing of the windows of opportunity for learning? I'll show you an essay today where there really does appear to be a pretty uh, confined critical period for the basic building blocks of language, the phonetic units. So work in my lab started with behavior, and I'll show you the behavioral assay. Uh, and we've learned a lot uh, by studying behavior about these windows, when they open, and what are the factors that control them. But in the last three years, we've been looking very, very carefully uh, at the development of the new tools. Uh, brain science hadn't provided us tools for babies, and so we were the first in the world to put babies in a, doing a cognitive task, like listening to languages, in an MEG machine. This is very, very challenging work, because, uh, the, but the baby has freedom to move. We're tracking the head with pellets on the head, so we always know where the brain structures are, so the children are free to move. She's listening to, uh, through insert earphones, to the sounds of many languages. So in addition to looking at brain function with magnetoencephalography, which gives you that beautiful timing and uh, location information, we've been working hard to develop tools for brain structure. We have a team of physicists and engineers working with psychologists and neurosciences to allow us to do, we've developed head models that are specific to the ages we're interested in, six-monthers and 12-monthers, and they allow us to do voxel-based morphometry, whole brain voxel-based morphometry, and produce predictions that will, areas of the brain that early in development will predict future language outcomes. And then finally, we're sticking our toe into uh, genetics. We'd like to relate brain structure and function to the genes that control uh, aspects of learning to behavior as people learn. So with that in mind, let's start with the assay that we've followed for many, many years. And the assay to study language is the initial learning that babies do, uh, phonetic perception. So the consonants and vowels, the building blocks of words, are what we focused on. And there's a very interesting critical period early in development, between six and nine months, when babies make a dramatic, dramatic change in what they are, what they're able to discriminate. So uh, I like to call them citizens of the world between six and eight months, meaning any sound of any language, that contrast, they can hear them all. And two months later, between eight and ten months primarily for most kids, 
they are zooming towards attending to the native language contrast and at the same time failing to discriminate non-native contrasts. So there's a process going on in that two-month period. Before that starts, they're citizens of the world. They discriminate everything. After that period, they are no longer citizens of the world. They're more like us. As adults, we discriminate the sounds of the language or languages that we're exposed to, but not the rest. This is the pathway to language. You can't discriminate words and learn words if you can't hear the differences between the building blocks. So it is that kind of gateway into language. This initial learning is really important. We've been studying how it works. We have a theory that we put on the table in 2007 that says the computational algorithms by which you learn language are controlled by the social brain, meaning we've called it the gating hypothesis. The social brain is gating when the algorithms work, and that's critical both in typical development and also for children with autism spectrum disorder, and I'll show you some data on both of them. Now what's interesting about this discriminatory ability is that you can, there's a neural signature of it, the MMN, and if you play a standard sound, ba, 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 and you change it 15% of the trials to pa or anything else, the baby shows this negativity in the brain waves that you can measure with event-related potentials. Now what's interesting about this very sensitive measure is we've been able to track how predictive these measures are of future performance. So if you take an early measure at seven months, so that's before typical kids are making this change, at seven months there's, some, there's great variation in when this window opens. So here's a baby in A in the ERP cap. In B you can see that baby's response to a native sound and a non-native sound. Now that performance predicts language out to 30 months at the speed of language acquisition and also predicts reading readiness at 5, regardless of SES, regardless of language at 2.5 years of age. So what's happening here on the left, you see when the native language sound is used to predict, the top half of the distribution in red is zooming up. Words that they're learning to produce are hugely and significantly better than the kids in the bottom half of the distribution who are not doing so well on native language discrimination. On the other hand, look to the right side. Kids who stay longer in that initial period, they treat native and non-native exactly the same. They're slower to acquire language. That commitment, that switch in attention to the stuff that matters to native language sounds that will build words in your culture is something that kids need to do before they're going to progress towards language. So this is a pretty important early period. What's going on? Well, there are two algorithms. One's computational and the other appears to be social. So when I say computational, there's a whole line of studies that not only my laboratory but Gary Marcus and a lot of other laboratories have shown that babies are sort of statistical learners. They take into account the stochastic, the stochastic properties of the information that they hear. And so for phonemes, they're actually taking into account frequency distributions of the sounds that they hear their adults in their culture produce. I'm going to let you listen to mother radius. This is mother's milk to the baby brain. Seriously, it helps stretch the distributions because when we speak motherese, we stretch the distance between sound, the critical units of sound. So you're going to hear an English-speaking woman and then a Japanese-speaking woman, and then I'll explain what happens. Ah, oh, I love your big blue eyes. So pretty and nice. Wow, so Okay, so as infants listen to this, they're actually taking into account, this is a cartoon, but they're taking into account the distributions of sounds. Japanese has lots of, uh, English has lots of R's and L's, so you see the bimodal distribution. Uh, Japanese has an intermediate sound called Japanese R. Babies are taking these statistics as they listen to us talk, particularly in motherese, because it stretches the distance between the two, uh, to the, to the uh, varying um, sounds. And their brains are changed by this. They become uh, the language-specific listener by doing this statistical analysis. Uh, in a few minutes in the laboratory, you can change their performance by exposing them to distributions that differ, that are more like Japanese <clears throat> or more like English. Now, there's this, this separate piece that's very interesting to us, is that the social brain seems to control when babies take their statistics, at least in complex natural language. So we did experiments where, for the first time, we exposed babies at nine months, their critical period for sounds, 
to a brand new language with brand new statistics. And the question is, does it alter their brains or not? Do they have to build up the statistical distributions over a long period of time, or can they just do it at nine months? So here's what the experiment looked like. Jasper, Okay, so what did we do to their little brains by exposing them to the first for the first time at nine months? They learned amazingly. They learned so well that they were statistically comparable to the kids in Taiwan who had been listening for 11 months. So they can take their statistics right at that time. It takes 12 sessions of 25 minutes in which they're exposed to bring about this change. Future studies show that they learn not only phonemes but words. When exposed to language like Spanish, they learn the words that they'd been exposed to frequently. And you could see that those signatures for learning were not there for words that they had not heard during exposures. So we needed to run this experiment, which was to present the same material recorded at the same time, beautiful DVDs, but now they're getting that same information over a television set. While kids were very, very attentive, they claw crawled up to the machine and, and touched it, they learned nothing. The brain signatures afterwards were just flat. They, looked, they were just like the kids exposed in the control group to English. So the social brain is required. We have done lots of experiments now where we try to make this, uh, this television set more social. The more social we make it, the more interactive we make it, the more children learn. The best way to have children learn in, from a machine is to put them with another child. There's a social arousal component here, we, we believe, where babies are collaborating as they learn, but the arousal increases as new partners. When children learn with new partners, their learning increases tremendously. Again, lots of studies are now suggesting in the lab that both the motivational aspect of the social brain and the information, the eye gaze, and other factors that you gain uh, by having infants follow the eye movements of another. So of course we're interested in what's going on in the brain as this critical moment at 12 months occurs. We've been studying the perception action systems and their linkage in the brain. There's a long history in speech about how listening to speech stores representations and memories that drive the motor system to allow babies to imitate. So we're doing experiments in which we present a standard sound to an infant in a MEG machine and then test, a standard sound is common to Spanish and English, and then two test sounds, an English sound and a Spanish sound. We layer all the multimodal imaging that we have on a particular infant, <clears throat> and here's what it looks like. So this is a 12-monther monolingual child. What we see is the segmentation produced by our head models and atlases that are age-specific. And then we look at the two structures, the auditory system, those two, and the two areas of brocas that we're looking at, the, and the arcuate between them. We have measurements on all of these from the children in the study. Now these bubbles are actually meg activity, volumetric meg activity. The red line at the bottom is what's happening in the auditory areas. The blue line at the bottom is brocas area. What's interesting is that just listening to speech at this age, and even at six months, is, activates brocas, and for the test sound, what you see is an increase in auditory activation for the test sound in the same language, and broca stays about the same. But when the Spanish test sound comes on, uh, there's a slight change in auditory, but the big change is in brocas. When listening to a non-native sound at 12 months, brocas area, who were positing brocas areas probably working on an internal model, trying an analysis by synthesis, try, because that's what babies have to do to talk back. They have to understand what's being said so they can begin to imitate, they can begin to volley back and forth. So these are very, very interesting tests because for the first time we can actually, in 3D, they're lovely, you can actually layer the volumetric data from Meg on other aspects of the brain that we understand about these babies. And we have shown in a second study now with totally different stimuli that this Broca's activation for non-native is there at 12 months, not at six months. Broca's is equal for native and non-native at six months. In adults, we see this pattern that the 12-monthers are showing. 
Other MEG data, this is, I won't have time to explain this very well, but this is theta brain rhythm. So a lot of us are looking at brain rhythms as a measure of things like learning and attention and cognitive effort. Theta in babies has been associated with cognitive effort and in adults, both attention and cognitive effort. And what we see is that the theta brain rhythms are indexing this transition in speech perception. So if you look just at the row for six-monthers, uh, any frequent sound, whether it's native or non-native, increases theta. It doesn't matter what language it comes from, theta is increased for the frequent sound. Babies don't know yet which sounds are native. So at six months, theta is driven by the frequent event. It's a very smart strategy. By 12 months, the frequency doesn't matter, and the language matters, whether it's a native or non-native sound. And here we see theta increases for the native sounds. Right at that transition point, babies are working hard to listen to and attend to native language sounds. In adulthood, it isn't the frequency. We can go to Japan or France, stay, spend a month in Paris. Hearing those distributions, that frequency does not change your perceptual system very much. So by that time, we're focused, as in adulthood, we're focused on learned categories. So there, it's the non-native that increases cognitive effort. What are the implications for autism? So I've described a socially driven computational system. What we've been doing is looking at early measures of children with autism. We published in PLOS One just a month ago, uh, brain responses in two-year-olds with autism predict outcomes better than any known measure at four years and six years. And I'm showing the measure at six years. There's a particular signature to known words in typical children. We use that measure in children with autism. And what we saw, there's great variance in the autism population. What's interesting, the correlations are very, very large. But what's interesting, the language measure predicted not only future language abilities, but future cognitive abilities and future abilities to adapt your behavior. What's interesting about that is that these, this measure of social learning seemed to predict learning more generally. So this two year, measuring at two years of age is excellent, but of course we want to go much earlier. A biomarker for autism would have to be effective at six months or 12 months. So we're now moving this paradigm down to 12 monthers uh, and looking at known words and the, um, in MEG, these data were EEG. So we're taking, I said, we, we're making a baby step towards understanding uh, the relationship between genes, brains, and learning. We're very interested in the reward system. We have a new postdoc, Ping uh, Mamiya, who's here today. And we've teamed up with Evan Eichler uh, at the University of Washington's Genome Sciences. And in this uh, uh, ping, in her previous work, she was with George Wagner at Rutgers. And she did knockout uh, studies with mice on the reward system. Reward system is very interesting because of the dopaminergic genes and our interest in social. Her work was looking at aggressive versus pro-social behaviors. We're interested in the relationship between genes that are associated with the dopaminergic system and the known polymorphism in these genes and predicting in a fairly small um, a cohort of new students coming to the UW from, um, from China who are in an intensive social learning experiment to try to uh, improve their English skills. And we're predicting that the uh, subjects in red will, have, will be better learners in this intensive course. Those in blue will be the poorest and those in green will be uh, in between. Uh, this gene is expressed in the human brain in the prefrontal cortex, and we can see from the atlas, um, the Allen Brain Atlas, exactly where that is. So what we're going to link are, is the gene expression uh, with learning and with the pathways um, done with um, probability tractography. So we'll have tractography, genes, and learning in this population. So I want to say something about the bilingual brain. So the bilingual brain is interesting because it's a computational strategy a challenge. You've got to keep two systems of statistics separate. You've also got social cues that indicate who is speaking what language. Our baby studies looking at uh, the ERP um, measure is suggesting to us that the opening of that period for sound learning is extended in bilingual children. So at every age when you compare monolinguals and bilingual children, the bilinguals are still more open to a strange new language. The bilingual kids are more open than the monolingual kids. The monolingual kids seem to close that period sooner. In fact, we think that adults who are bilingual or trilingual are more open all their lives.
So we've been looking at the tractography of the monolingual and bilingual brain. And in this first result, we're looking at uh, fractional anisotropy and radial diffusivity. Now, some of you know what that is. FA basically describes the degree of constraint, you know, how many of the pathways are going in a consistent unidirectional way. RA is more freedom in the lateral uh, direction. And we hypothesized an interaction that given the flexibility of the bilingual brain, not only linguistically but cognitively, so co it, the executive function in bilinguals, in babies and adults, is more flexible. They're more, it's not smarter, but there is a, me many, many measures that have to do with executive function that show that you can switch your rules. If you've been uh, habitually doing a particular thing in a particular way, you have a better ability to switch that faster and more accurately if you're bilingual. So we predicted that monolinguals would show more FA and bilinguals will should, should show more RA, stronger RA when compared to the uh, other population. So let's look at this. So this is FA on the right side. All of these areas are areas in which the uh, tractography is saying that there's more, are higher values of FA in the monolinguals and the bilinguals. You can see it's all over the brain. These are the top areas. These are all, after correction, 0.02 effects. So they're huge. Just the opposite in RA. So these are RAs in favor of where bilinguals are showing greater um, fibers uh, that have greater RA as you do the tractography. So again, these same areas, the thalamic uh, radiations, occipital fascicularis, longitudinal fascicularis, these are the areas, but hugely, hugely significant differences between the monolingual and the bilingual brain. So these studies are showing that being bilingual changes a lot about how your brain is structured. It changes a lot about how brain is functioned how brain functions, and cognitively as well as linguistically. Okay, translational science, two impacts that I simply want to measure quickly. As I said, language growth requires input during a critical period. What well, we've known since 1995, Hart and Riesley did a study in which they looked at the number of words that kids are hearing at home, and huge difference between professional families, working class families, and families in the welfare system. There's just not as much talk going on in homes. We also just demonstrated in 2008 the Broca's area of function uh, related to uh, rhyming and the necessary skills for reading. If you do fMRI on five-year-olds while they're rhyming, the, most, the strongest factor after correction for multiple comparisons is not IQ or social skills or cognitive skills of the children when tested on new things, but the socioeconomic status of the child's family. So we think of SES as it's called, as a proxy for learning. And if children don't have the opportunity, if they're not talked to a lot, if they don't have a chance to talk back and, <clears throat> and engage, uh, they will not, um, their brains may. This is an association, not causal, but it's very, very interesting. The White House seems to be paying attention. There is a conference next week run by the White House's uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy to try to tackle the preparation gap because what it, what it means is kids are coming into first grade and it's not a level playing field. Uh, their brains may be different by virtue of the fact that they grew up in families in which there's not an understanding of the need to talk to children. Uh, we're doing other studies that are very, very interesting. I'll just mention it quickly. We think there's also a, a critical period for early musical training. Uh, people trained on musical instruments uh, in, in serious ways before seven uh, seem to be better than uh, children and adults who learned after, even when you control for the amount of practice that they've done. So we're doing exposure studies with babies. So nine-monthers are coming into the lab, just like in our language exposure experiments with their parents. It's social, they're with other babies, and they're listening to a particular rhythm. And after 12 sessions, we're testing them in the mag machine for their sensitivity to that rhythm and also for other durational cues that occur in certain languages. We think that we will see definitely an enhancement to that rhythm uh, in children who are exposed. We also think there might be a spillover effect to language, that the system is being tuned through early experience to music and to the structure of, of sound. And then finally, one of the most fun experiments we're doing 
is uh, trying to tackle face-to-face -face neuroscience. We're strong believers in social interaction as one of the keys to this early period and to more complex al algorithms related to learning. So we've started a technically, again, extremely challenging experiment where the baby's in the MEG machine and mom is wearing an ERP um, EEG cap and these two signals are co-registered. These two brains are co-registered while mom interacts with the child as opposed to looks away from the child. And we're hoping to see what synchronous social activity looks like and potentially the kinds of um, internal structure, Broca's area activation that may happen when you're interacting with other human beings. So I just want to end by saying these kinds of experiments are are all uh, laborious and uh, it takes a ton of people, an army of researchers across nations because they speak different languages and come with very, very different uh, technical and, uh, and other skills and of course lots of resources. So we appreciate the financing that we received from all of these units. Thank you very much. Yes. No, we have not. <clears throat> we have not. What's your hypothesis? Well, there's a lot of work coming out in early development of uh, kids that have been exposed to general anesthetics at young ages. Oh, huh. no, that's and interesting. I would think these techniques <clears throat> would lend themselves to Yeah, that. they would. Yeah, that's very interesting. Right. It's been very controversial because you have to look for a, a lot of different signs and then you worry right. about it. These yeah. measures are very sensitive. As I said, the whole brain voxel-based morphometry shows two areas in the brain at six months that predict language much later, uh, right cerebellum and right hippocampus. Kids are learning and remember, remembering. They're getting ready to build motor patterns that allow them to talk back. So is there a range in the openness that you see in adults? Because it's sort of anecdotally known yes. that some adults can pick up languages yeah. better than others. Yeah. So what's the spread among the population? Well, the spread is huge. And it, hap it happens to seem to depend on, on early experience. The more languages you heard early, so hearing a second language early, I think builds a different brain, one that's more flexible. But exactly nailing that down, we're beginning to with the tractography. But uh, you know, we also think that the social brain, that we're not teaching second languages appropriately. We're just not doing it right. That if you embed learning past the critical period, past seven, it's typically thought zero to seven, all the studies show that after seven, you're learning in a totally different way. But learning socially, as we've demonstrated in Japanese studies with Meg before and after, I think social enables learning in a different way. Does it enable it completely? I don't know. Yeah, right. <clears throat> right. I think that some of that could be true. It still may be operating under different mechanisms, though. We don't know. What about those uh, individuals who, after decade-long exposure to different uh, linguistic environment, mm. and despite being exposed to uh, multiple language early on, still fail to learn yeah. the statistics of, uh, of, a new language. of a new language? I think it's interesting. I mean, there must be something going on that controls this, this learning. And it's heightened in children b below the age of seven. And you know, why is that the case? We, we, we don't know. But we may, with the brain studies, actually see uh, what's happening. We think that a language builds an architecture in the brain with these attentional networks and executive function. These three systems, uh, the language computational areas, uh, frontal cortex and executive function, and the reward system, these work together because that change in attention is necessary. We can see it's correlated with how well the kids are learning. So there might be something with executive function that's um, different. I was wondering your thoughts on right. people, uh, right, ah. right there, Hello. Gary. Um, I was wondering your thoughts on people with autism who do manage to learn language. So the, the least social people that, that succeed, are right. they using different algorithms? How do you think about that? Well, yeah, they could be using different algorithms. So, so the, the, what's interesting about uh, children with autism is the wide range of the spectrum is huge. So that's why you need an assay that's very sensitive. And I think an assay that's related to social learning. So we think it takes this computational algorithm and the social algorithm. Kids with autism have the computational algorithm, is our argument. But they don't have the social algorithm. They, they are not interested in looking at faces or listening to language. If you give them a choice, they'd rather listen to uh, noises composed from speech but don't sound like speech. 
right? They'll look away from human faces. The studies by a graduate student at UCSD in California showing that if you use ERP methods that sample the reward system, SPN and FRN, that uh, children with autism uh, are, are more rewarded by arrows up and down than by faces smiling and frowning. That reward system is impaired, not the reward system itself, but socially rewarding. Um, that system is not working. Jim. So there's an apocryphal <clears throat> belief that, apocryphal belief that the, the Swiss people are so dull because <laughs> they know so many languages. Oh. So is there any, <laughs> I, could you react I've, to I've been whether... all over the world, and that hypothesis I have never heard. That <laughs> I, I, I have found that people who, I think all of Europe and people who know many languages are tremendously social. I think it's very, and, and engaging, because they, but are because, they creative? I, are they creative? I, you know, I have no measure, of no assay of that, but, but my feeling is that the more languages and cultures that you come in contact with, language is the pathway to culture, one pathway to culture, that that allows your brain to imagine more uh, possibilities. But I guess that's just because I love languages. Yeah. We have not done that, but we imagine that that could be interesting and taxing. I think hearing two languages and not very much language input, we've been looking at quantity versus quality. Quality matters. The more one-on-one -on -one conversations and the more motheries directed to children in the very early period, the faster their language skills grow. There's reasons for that, but we probably don't have time to. Uh, family size doesn't matter in our data set. No. So we have time for one more question. I think we need to yeah. move on. So regarding to the socioeconomics, mm -hmm. do you think that kids that uh, have that gap mm -hmm. later on, mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to make up by a different type of teaching, different well, strategies, or they will never come back? The teachers tell you no. Teachers tell you that kids coming in at five without good executive function skills and without good language skills, that it's really, some teachers will say it's impossible to catch them up. They will be poor readers in first grade, poor readers in first grade, or poor readers forever. And so we're really thinking that an intervention, that possibly a public service campaign that makes people understand the importance of talking to kids, but that should be done. It is something we could eliminate. We could eradicate the preparation gap. It's not fair not to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Pat.